So in this talk, I'm going to go through mission critical data, uh, the role of Apache Cassandra in a lot of financial institutions, and the importance of evaluating the community in OSS. A little bit uh, before I go into the introduction about me, uh, I'm a consultant at Datastax. We work with Apache Cassandra, Datastax Enterprise, and Datastax Astra customers. The finance industry um, is one among many different industries that we work in. These are some of the companies that I'm allowed to talk about that we work with. You can see that we have a lot of experience working with uh, all of you. A little bit more about myself. Oh, sorry, one more slide. And if you haven't heard of Datastax, Datastax was the company behind Apache Cassandra. It today offers a uh, database as a service offering called Astra DB, that is an Apache Cassandra compatible uh, offering, as well as uh, offering for uh, Apache Pulsar uh, and, and other solutions. Datastax just a couple of weeks ago got uh, a new funding round. We got $115 million by Goldman Sachs and others. In the current economic climate, that gives you an idea of how well we are doing and how foundational we are to so many different companies and so many different sectors. We'll, we'll touch on some of that later in the slide. And finally, the introduction about me. Uh, I have been passionate about open source for a long time now. Uh, I have been involved in Apache Cassandra going back to 2011 and I've been involved in many other open source projects since then. My day job is being a consultant. I, along the way, realized that I get a lot more enjoyment out of helping people and uh, with their technical solutions uh, and meeting new people uh, along the way. And so my full-time job is not to be an engineer on open source. And I think that's important uh, for some of the things that I will talk later about, that you don't have to be a full-time dedicated OSS person to play a valuable and meaningful role as a contributor towards open source. In this talk, I'm going to talk about I'm going to break it down into five sections. I'm going to do a quick introduction to Apache Cassandra uh, and what it is, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. I'm going to do a quick run through of how Apache Cassandra is used in the finance industry and with the customers uh, that we work with. I'm going to wrap that up with giving you some code examples that you can grab the links to or the QR codes to, and go home and, and play with those examples, those best practices, uh, follow the patterns that we work with in the industry. I'm going to look at where Apache Cassandra and its ecosystem is moving into the future. And lastly, and I hope most interestingly, I'm going to look at uh, the importance of looking behind the curtain to these projects and these technologies and into the communities. Okay, so first up, Apache Cassandra. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that there's a good chance that you use Apache Cassandra as a database more than any other database in your day. Uh, yeah, a lot of people haven't heard of it. Apple iCloud. Netflix, Spotify, Instagram, TikTok, your bank, your insurance company, your telecom operator. Chances are they're using Apache Cassandra. Why is it that people choose Apache Cassandra? Originally, it was built as, uh, out of necessity. So it is a database which is always on, it scales uh, linearly, and it's a real-time or low-latency database. 
In the early days of Cassandra, it earned itself the reputation as the database of last resort. People would uh, realize the RDMS systems weren't working. Um, it was too difficult once they're above four terabytes or eight terabytes and for their operational application stack they needed a NoSQL solution and they'll try different NoSQL, no, different NoSQL solutions. Eventually they figured out Apache Cassandra was the one that actually did the job properly. It has over the years developed slowly at times because people, the engineers, were very conscious about implementing things the right way. That's the reason why Apple uses it. That's the reason why Netflix uses it. For the biggest of the biggest clusters, it's the database you use. Also on this slide, uh, one of the, the key features that Apache Cassandra offers and does best is this global distribution, at least in the open source world. Global replicas. How do we use this in finance today? There are lots of, lots of use cases out there. Uh, when we work with our customers, it's used everywhere. This kind of makes sense because it's not a high level technology, it's quite a raw level technology um, that gives you key functionality and a foundation. And so if you've got a use case that needs lots of data or must always be on, those use cases um, fall in. If I was going to distill it down to a few examples uh, that we see at the moment, let's start off with data modernization and transformation. That's a really obvious one. It's a very simple uh, one, but it is a large part of our activity still. Uh, the finance industry, you know, the, the technological stacks that you've got are huge, they're massive and they're old. You've got thousands of components in them. Modernizing them is hard work. The customer 360, um, yeah, all the different 360 views, and once you get more and more of them real time, then you can go to the 720 or what we call the omni-channel. Uh, you've got recommendations, real-time fraud, risk analysis, all of that ML, all of that when you bring data uh, from your warehouses or your analytics and you need to bring it back into feature stores um, or just that type of stuff. Payment processing at scale, uh, crypto currency, uh, which when we look at it at a purely engineering point of view, it's time series data, um, metadata around um, uh, blockchain. And then of course you've got data governance and democratization. I'm going to go through a couple of architectural slides. I'm going to skim over them quickly. Uh, the slide deck you can download. For me to go into this stuff properly, it'll probably take a couple of hours. Uh, there's just a couple of key points that I want to show on each slide. This one is uh, what a lot of modern architecture should look like or what we're pushing a lot of people towards. It's a best practice slide. What I like about this slide is it shows a lot of open source components, how you can get your full stack up and running largely with open source. Here you have uh, your microservices. It's not working on there. Uh, microservices stack, this is your application or um, operational stack, and then here you have your data warehouses. Uh, it's a little box in reality, and it's a much, much bigger box in this industry. The second slide that I want to look at is largely the same. Here it's uh, focusing on, and we use it for data modernization. What you see here, and what's important is the role of bringing in microservices 
and your streaming services. Again, this is really simple stuff, but it's what we're having to do a lot of the time with these legacy platforms to modernize them. Uh, this leads on to common tactics like CRQS, uh, CQ, C, CRQS, command query uh, uh, responsibility segregation, and domain-driven encapsulation. These are key tactics. That modernization then leads to a uh, possibility for transformation. Dallastex has written a really awesome paper, white paper, about this that goes through the different tactics uh, that we go through to bring these legacy platforms up to scratch. I do recommend that you uh, download that white paper and give it a read. The last architectural slide that I've got here is Uh, one for customer 360. I'm still struggling with the double computers. It's hard work. <laughs> Things you haven't practiced for. Uh, this is a slide that we typically use for 360. I don't want to talk so much about the 360 aspect of it today. Uh, what I want to talk about is there's something interesting happening in this slide. So here we're focused in on one app. Um, uh, so we're not really worrying about the microservices stack anymore. It's still there, but uh, in this slide, in this diagram, the streaming services is the central component in this platform. So this is that realization of an event-driven architecture. And once you've got that streaming services um, or event-driven design, properly into the platform, uh, a number of, there are a number of interesting consequences. One of them is that uh, you no longer need to bring data from your warehouses and your analytic stacks back through into your operational stack or database. The data comes into your streaming system and from there it writes both into your application or operational database and into your data warehouses at the same time. This is what gives us real-time systems. This is what provides, when you're doing your ML models and stuff, instead of it being um, delayed in time, you get real-time capabilities. So that was skimming through the easy stuff. Um, and I wanted to do that just to create that platform for the, the, the picture of where you should be going because you need that to take the next step in the more interesting stuff with the uh, machine learning, with the real time, with the innovation. And it comes back to this idea that uh, if you want to be innovating, if you want that soft AI in your application, in your business, you've got to have real time data. This idea of moving data into warehouses and figuring out what's valuable and what you have and then bringing it back, you can't innovate like that. As our CEO says, you can't innovate at the speed of a batch. A couple of code examples that I've got. Uh, the first one is a simple little uh, Python app called DS Bank. It gives you uh, the ability to uh, create a bank account, create different cards. You can then uh, watch transactions happen. You can have live dashboards. This is to illustrate that uh, a base architecture for real-time processing uh, and streaming. It's a solution based off Apache Pulsar, Apache Cassandra, uh, and GraphQL, and Stargate. Um, so it shows you how you can put these things together without, in your microservices stack, client-side coupling of dependencies, which is what your database client drivers essentially are. And uh, it also uh, does it with Apache Pulsar. What we are seeing with our customer base, the people who need Apache Cassandra, they're getting a lot out of using Apache Pulsar instead of Apache Kafka. 
uh, the volumes of data with the uh, global deployment and with elasticity needs, Apache Pulsar is easier to operate and has a higher throughput. Next code example is a simple cryptocurrency commerce app. Um, it works through a MetaMask wallet, which is just a plugin in your browser. Once you've got that uh, wallet in your browser, you can run this app and it just creates, uh, as, a, as a seller, you can just upload an image, call it NFT, um, list it, and then people can bid on it and then you can buy it and you can um, go through that. Under the hood, in Apache Cassandra, it is essentially just time series uh, data. And an, old exa an older example that we've got is uh, the banking IoT. Again, this shows transactions in uh, time series, being able to label and search it. Okay. Moving forward. Cassandra has been uh, asleep for the last five years, and in the last uh, in the last year or so, it's starting to waken up. We've got a number of big contributors, Apple, Netflix, uh, and data stacks, all coming back uh, and coming back in a big way. So I wanted to do a quick run through of what is happening with Apache Cassandra and what is happening around Apache Cassandra. So first up, and this is from a developer's point of view, we have an open source project called Stargate. What Stargate does is it creates like a coordinator layer on top of the cluster. And it provides you an interface where you can use Apache Cassandra, and it works with other databases as well, uh, using gRPC, GraphQL, REST, and JSON. We see more and more enterprises, more and more people not wanting SQL, not wanting SQL, not wanting any client driver. They want in their microservices stack to be minimalizing the protocols that are used between services. And your database or your search engine, it's just un should be treated as just another microservice. From an operationals point of view, we have the Kate Sandra um, open source project. It is a operator, a Kubernetes operator for a full Cassandra stack. So not only do you get Apache Cassandra in it, you get the Reaper repair tool, you get uh, the MCAC, Prometheus, and Grafana dashboards, you get that Stargate uh, layer. And being opinionated ops, it makes life a bit easier um, when it comes to scaling and elasticity. And it gives you that, that freedom to operate uh, in different clouds. Finally, coming to Apache Cassandra. Uh, 4.0 took us many years to get out. As uh, the Cassandra momentum built up again, uh, our first objective was stability and QA of the code. So one of the things the community com made a commitment to was as an early maturity technology, we had to take a step away from uh, you know, what's auto typical in the open source world of the uh, people going, you know, I'm not going to feel safe deploying this into my production until it's at the third or the fifth or the sixth patch version. Um, leading up to 4.0, we said that had to stop. Apache Cassandra at a 0, 0.0 version had to be safe for everyone's production. It had to be production ready and safe even for the biggest clusters out there. It took us a long time to make that properly happen. At the same time, we saw 4.0 25% faster, uh, especially faster for the biggest clus clusters. Uh, moving on to 4.1, uh, we shifted from QA and stability of the code to pluggability. 
Um, this is as we saw it being a early maturity technology and it itself moving into a little bit more of a slow lane mode of development. A lot of our contributions now are coming from other people's forks of Cassandra. Uh, so a little bit like the Linux kernel, um, we're seeing patches being contributed to us which have already been running in other people's production systems. Um, so we're seeing, we're seeing less commits in the source control. Uh, but of higher quality. That has led on to the need for more pluggability as those different downstream people are doing different things with Apache Cassandra. 4.2, there's something really interesting happening. Apple wrote the Accord consensus paper. Apple uh, looked at uh, Paxos, Epaxos, Ramp, Janus, all of the different consensus protocols out there and they tried to put them together and figure out what they needed for uh, globally distributed transactions. And so they came up with the Accord consensus and that has been implemented uh, in Cassandra 4.2. This is a game changer. This means you can do transactions, not just cross petition, but cross table. On the optimal read path, it is a one or a single round trip to do a transaction. So that means that we can do cross-continent acid transactions um, fast. We're not talking slow like Spanner. Um, Cassandra is a real-time low latency database. That's an important characteristic that we want to keep um, and this fits into it. So stay tuned for that. Uh, 4.2 will also have storage attached indexes that allows us to have a lot more secondary indexes in a cluster and try mem tables, which is very important for uh, even more performance on data, which is a very high frequency of updates uh, to the data. Okay, so the last section of this presentation and the one that I'm most excited about, this is the one that gets me out of bed in the morning, the community. Looking at the community behind an open source project. This is uh, the section where I get to convince you that you should judge other human beings. Um, it's the paradox, if we want inclusive, inclusiveness, if we want diversity, uh, we have to judge people. Uh, you need to uh, know when you walk into a room with a group of people, are these people that I want to hang out with? Are these my people? If they're not, get out. So let's start off with uh, the question of why do we choose open source? If you ask engineers, they'll say uh, transparency and efficiency. I don't think there are enough, good enough reasons why companies uh, have standardized on open source. And I think it's interesting because the choice about the tools to use here is not, doesn't have anything to do with the choice of tools we make. Let me explain that. Um, I think that, that as we move towards microservices, as we move to more compartmentalized platforms, we need to have the freedom to operate. And open source often enables that. It allows us to interchange or change uh, the technologies that we use over time as our needs change and as the technologies change. That allows us to worry less about the choice of tools and more about our business strategies. But there's a catch. One of the other things that people can sometimes say about open source and why we choose it is because it's free. That's complete nonsense. There is no free lunch. If open source was free, it would be free as in free puppy. If you choose to use open source, at some level, you need to take responsibility for it. 
And there are different ways that that plays out. You need to show up. It is a problem that we have a lot of employees still not encouraging their employees to contribute back to open source, even forbidding it in some situations. Um, and we need to address that. So if, if you need to show up with open source, that leads into having to judge the community. How do we go about doing that? In open source, there are lots of different types of projects. They come in all shapes and sizes. You have the projects which are in foundations um, or are sponsored by large companies. And a lot of companies today are standardizing, um, saying these are the only open source technologies that you're allowed to use. We also have uh, the bizarre of uh, one man, uh, even unmaintained or pet projects on GitHub. Um, I'm hijacking the cathedral and the bizarre uh, analogy there for a completely different purpose. Um, we shouldn't look past those GitHub projects. We shouldn't necessarily think that just because an open source project isn't alive or it's only got one contributor and there's a risk associated to it, um, we should you can and we should often look at those types of open source projects just as reference code. So it's a completely different way. It's not something that you engage with. It's simply like finding the perfect function on Stack Overflow and saying, that code does exactly what I want. Let me pull it in as a dependency in my project. But at the end of the day, you're treating it like it's your own code. You took a scan through it and you're gone, I like that code. It does what it's... Um, I need it to, and it's safe. I'll take responsibility for it, and I'll include it. Um, the foundations are a bit different. The foundations uh, have different companies involved, um, and there are different things to look at. There are simplifications and generalizations made about the different foundations, just like with open source licenses. And there is no good and bad here. The different foundations work in different contexts and have different pros and cons. The CNCF can be labeled as a pay-to-play environment. The Apache Software Foundation can be labeled as a volunteer-only environment. These things aren't necessarily true. There's history there, there's different contexts. CNC and CNCF is a, a foundation where larger players, companies have come together, um, and especially in the cloud space and Kubernetes, for example, they've got a, a natural dynamic where they're equal players and they've wanted to come together and collaborate together on something, and that is essentially what is at the heart of open source software. If two players in the market want to join together and collaborate, they will move faster than everyone else in the field. And you can't change that. It doesn't matter where open source goes into the future, cloud or um, whatever, that dynamic of open source will never change and why it will succeed and, and be our standard moving forward. Um, the Apache Foundation is different in that it uh, covers a lot more different types of projects, uh, projects which have a lot more different dynamics with the companies that are involved in them and how they collaborate, big companies and little companies and unpaid uh, collaborators, contributors. And what the ASF did um, from the beginning was say, let's take the notion of a company out um, of the open source community. And the, the only thing that we recognize in the community is the individual human being. And when we associate trust to that human being, it does not expire because we've learned that person um, and we've come to trust them and they're established. And that is a way of, of leveling the playing field so that companies of different sizes or unpaid contributors can all come in. 
There's more to look at it here too as well. You want to look at how many companies are involved in the project. Is this an open source product which is uh, just code thrown over the wall? Is it OSS as marketing? Um, how in that project, in that community, are passers-by treated? When you look through the commit history of the project, are they um, only from dedicated engineers employed by one company or just a few a handful of companies? Or is it a project which is a swarm of small contributions coming in from everywhere? Do you, when you look through the ticket system and the, the the community dev list um, or their channels, do you get an idea of their product management? Um, what is their roadmap? Is it out in the open? Are they including you with where they're going and what people's needs are? Or do you get a feeling that this is behind closed doors and that uh, if you turn up with a contribution, you're kind of at their, their mercy, at their whim, of whether that will be included and it will align um, with what they need? That leads on to, once you understand the different types uh, of projects um, and the different dynamics into those communities, they, um, you, you can start also at the same time looking at the warmth of that community, looking at that inclusiveness of the community. You can also look at the diversity uh, of the community. That's a tricky one because diversity is something that follows. So a young community may have a good warmth and a good inclusiveness, and you would hope that diversity comes soon after. But, um, they do all uh, combine. So that wraps it up for me. Um, this is my last slide. So. I hope I've convinced you that you need to judge the community behind your open source project. Uh, that, that the diversity and the inclusiveness of a community, it relates to the longevity, the quality, the security. That was something that was touched on the keynote this morning. Um, and ultimately, it comes back to your costs and your success of your own application. It's going to be, when you look at that community, it's going to be a indicator to how, how fruitful your own possibly very limited contributions to that project will be. I think it's important uh, that we, we recognize that this is our work, this is our jobs. Um, you know, this is, this is your, what, what, 40 hours a week or more. These are the people that you surround yourself with. I think we all know that uh, if you turn up to work and you have a team of people around you, it doesn't need to be the smartest people. If it's a team that works well, you will get great things accomplished. And it doesn't apply only in your own company. It applies in open source as well. And sooner or later, you will um, interact. That is me. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I've gone a little bit over time. Uh, a quick uh, thank you to my employee as well, uh, my sponsor. Uh, Datastax has an offering, a subscription called Datastax Luna. Uh, that is uh, our support subscription for both Apache Cassandra and Apache Pulsar. And as well, uh, we have a offering here. If you grab the QR code, you can get $250 of credit to Astra, which is our Apache Cassandra database as a service offering. If you want to get started with Apache Cassandra, I really recommend that you jump onto Astra because you can uh, avoid the whole setup and the operational uh, um, startup bootstrap. Just get playing with the database immediately in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much.